Hey folks, it's Swank Ivy again with another Letters to an Asexual. This should be number 67. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, a comment I got regarding my book. Um, most of you probably know that I'm the author of The Invisible Orientation, which is um, known as the first mainstream published book by an asexual person about asexuality and the asexual experience. Um, I didn't really want it to be like the asexual book because that's a lot of pressure and I don't want to be known as like the person who's trying to speak for everybody. But uh, at the same time, I thought it should be done by an asexual person at some point. There already existed lots of self-published books that had less mainstream distribution, and there was a textbook already by Anthony Bogart, which was um, academic. Uh, my book is not intended to be academic, but because there were a lot of claims in it where I was using research, um, I did sometimes add quotes and then footnote where I got them from. And um, as you'll see as I share my letter with you today, um, that was one of the things that I got criticized for in what's sort of a review but wasn't really a review. Before I go into the actual wording of the criticism that I got, um, I want to say that in general, it is a bad idea for authors to kind of talk back to their reviewers. So um, this is kind of a gray area for me because normally I wouldn't want to make people feel like they can't say anything negative about my work or I'm going to clap back at them in a video and try to embarrass them or something. That is not the spirit in which I'm doing this. Um, mostly I want to show the kind of comment that I'm getting, which just happens to be a response to something in my book um, as an example of a larger problem that asexual people face. Um, so specifically, uh, before I ramble too much about uh, the situation, before you guys know what it is, uh, I'll go ahead and jump in and read uh, a series of comments that this person made. It was sort of a mm, blogging, live blogging kind of situation. Uh, while reading my book, the person was reacting to it, and uh, they didn't have any positive things to say. It was just mostly criticism, and to me, the comments just seemed, um, on the petty side, they seemed really, uh, what's a good word for it? They seemed, like, angrily expectant of something that I didn't give them. So... In a blog post that this person wrote, they opened by saying, there are so many claims in this book with no source to back it up. And they quote from a section in my book about libido and masturbation. Um, they quoted my section that says this, most openly asexual people are frequently asked to disclose explicit information about self-stimulation, often by strangers. And their reaction is this, this is a very specific claim, often by strangers, but what is the source? Has there been a survey of asexuals that has shown strangers often show little regard for their privacy? And then another quote from my book, whether asexual people masturbate is a topic of much concern and curiosity. Their reaction definitely seems plausible. I can picture people being fascinated by asexuality and wondering about these things, but again, what is the origin of this assertion? There were tons of sources at the start of the book. Where are they now when she starts bringing up all this inappropriate behavior toward asexuals? Another quote from my book, you'd better get your hormones checked, is one of the most common reactions asexual people hear. Their reaction, no source! And another quote from my book, many non-asexual people aren't willing to try sex with someone they're not at all attracted to, and this is usually considered reasonable, and yet, Suddenly, when it's asexual people in question, they're often considered unreasonable for saying no for the same reason. Their reaction? That sounds horrific. How often does it happen? How many asexuals does this happen to? Oh, right, we can't know, because this statement doesn't have a source. 
Everything else in the book is sourced. Cherry-picked sometimes, but still sourced. Even the part about asexual BDSM has a source. Yet, as soon as it comes to mistreatment of asexuals, there is no evidence. Again, I want to make it clear that I do believe asexual people face discrimination and prejudice, but this book so far has neglected to give any proof of it happening but continues to say over and over that it happens, and that it happens often. That tells me nothing. I want research. I want surveys. I want numbers. If someone has proof of these claims and wants to reblog this post to show me, sure, I'd gladly read it. But the burden of proof lies with the person making the claim. And so far, in the invisible orientation, evidence of Julie's claims about how asexuals are treated are just that, invisible. Um, I'll get back to where the person said my... Um, science is cherry-picked in a minute because I do have kind of a response to that as well. Um, but while I appreciate that the person added on, hey, I believe you that you experience prejudice and discrimination because that's kind of important. At first when I saw this person kind of going after me for like, where's your proof? Where's your proof? I'm thinking, did you read this book uh, specifically to look for evidence that it doesn't make its case or something because you always have to wonder when people say things like this well why are they interested in the subject and um, now going into what I would say as an answer to that person if they were watching me um, if they were watching me they wouldn't ask that question because um, as many of you know if you watch these videos uh, tons of my videos have evidence that people are always asking us about masturbation, people are always asking us inappropriate questions about our sexual stimulation and our sexual history, lots of people are always asking us about whether we have a libido, and um, we get certain questions pretty frequently. I have not done a survey because I am not a scientist, and I am not an academic. I'm not conducting research. I'm describing my own experience. And what often happens in any context where people who have a marginalized identity describe their experience and people respond with, well, I want numbers. How often does it happen? Who is it happening to? Show me documentation. Um, that's kind of a gotcha. It's like, well, if you can't show me this, if you can't show me documentation, then I'm immediately going to object to that. And even when it's kind of softer, like this person, where they said, I believe you experienced the discrimination, but I need to see the numbers, even that is still in this camp, because that is not usually how experience works. Um, you usually don't have a picture of it. You usually don't have a recording of the pattern of this in your life. But because I don't have a specific source to quote on that, I mean, I would venture to say that most of the descriptions of uh, mistreatment of asexual people has been in more qualitative situations where we talk about it to the media or we talk about it in our blogs or we talk about it on YouTube. We talk about things that happen to us, but that doesn't mean that it's not documented, it's just I don't have a scientific survey to quote. Um, as a person who doesn't conduct that kind of research, I guess I can't really help what's out there to quote, but I kind of resent that I'm being presented as if I'm saying something that is poorly documented and that therefore that was uh, inappropriate to include in a book like this, because it absolutely is a very common experience of asexual people to be asked, like, you know, these asexual bingo questions. They wouldn't be on the asexual bingo squares if they weren't common. Asexual bingo isn't something I'm going to be able to quote in a footnote in the book, whereas a lot of the other stuff that I was talking about toward the beginning of the book um, has been documented in scientific studies because I was talking about um, things that had been studied. Um, so I find it kind of suspicious that when I say things like many or a lot because I don't have a number, somebody says, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, 
you have to be respectable here and put a number on that because I'm not going to accept many. But that is a true statement. It is many. And if you actually do want to find it, all you have to do is read some asexual blogs. Um, the way that the person phrased their, hey, I believe that asexual people experience this uh, reaction, it does make me think they're not part of the community, so they wouldn't have personally known that this happens. But I don't understand why it's so objectionable to say something like many or a lot. Um, it's clear that it's many of us. Um, I don't think that that makes the claim less believable because there's not a number on it. Um, I think being that I've been in the community for a very long time, I've also had a lot of conversations with people and I have some understanding of what the common responses are. And this has been validated by all of the conversations that I've had with some of you guys. And all my comments are always filled up with, yeah, I got that too, that happened to me, I don't know what to say when people are always saying this to me and that to me. And even when I address it in a, in a video, my comments will often fill up with detractors and trolls who are saying the exact thing that I'm debunking in the video. So um, it's not hard to find examples of these things. I don't know at what point it crosses a threshold into that's enough to call it a lot, but I feel like the tendency to put marginalized people on these spotlighted trial situations where they're like, oh, 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 wait, did you just say something that doesn't have a source? I'm gonna need numbers. And I don't know why the numbers are necessary for you to believe that this is, this is an experience that people in this community say, yeah, that happens to us. Um, now, if I was making a scientific claim about that without quoting any numbers, if I, for instance, was saying the majority of asexual people have experienced this, and I didn't put any quote on that and for a scientific study, I think that would be an unscientific statement. Um, but the fact that the book is not an academic piece should help people understand that you know it, it is not intended to be held to scientific standards and because of some of the conversations I've had with scientists who are anti-asexuality or they're people who are looking for a reason to uh, disbelieve us I find that when I say you don't need science to be allowed to make this statement, you don't need scientific backup, they will interpret that as saying, well, you hate science or you're anti-science, and that's not true. Uh, when you talk about asexuality being a name for the feeling of not experiencing sexual attraction, all you're saying is, this is my experience, and sexual attraction is it's usually what causes people to label their sexual orientation. And a sexual orientation is, for everybody, historically the name for a feeling. So I don't know why it is that when we start talking about our feelings and putting a name on those things, people are saying, well, you're just emotional, you're just talking about feelings. That's very dismissive. It, it feels to me like they're looking for a reason to say what you're saying is suspicious and for that reason I don't want to listen to you because you're not backing it up with facts that I respect. And also the tendency to only believe facts that are delivered in a certain kind of packaging is also sort of an upholding of the status quo, of specifically of sexual education, but that's kind of a whole different conversation. It's about how the status quo is maintained by people who control the information and how it's disseminated, what the standards are for getting published in a journal and being respectable. 
and um, honestly, uh, I'm not asking for people to treat it like it's a scientific statement that I know I'm not making a scientific statement when I say many people have told me this. Um, so it really is um, troubling that that is what somebody calls out. That's, that's what somebody gets furious over and that's what somebody says makes them not take my book seriously that they also don't take my experience seriously, that my reporting of what happens to me isn't enough. And if you've read the book, you've probably noticed that the introduction, which is only a few pages, is the only place where I specifically talk about my personal experience. Everything else is more general with a few quote boxes from other asexual people who allowed me to use their quotes for illustrative purposes. Um, that I'm not mostly talking about myself, I'm talking about patterns that I have seen repeatedly as an asexual person. And, you know, that shouldn't be suspicious for somebody who's been in the community for such a long time to say, I've noticed these patterns, but I'm not going to pull something out of my butt and pretend that it was scientific when it wasn't. It's just also still valuable. So, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the second quote. So let me see. This was a whole second blog post that the person was continuing to hold my quotes to very weird standards by my estimation. Um, so here's what they said. Uh, I checked out Julie Sandra Decker's The Invisible Orientation when you, when you read the text, everything looks fine, but when you actually look up the sources she provides, it becomes apparent that she is cherry-picking. Look at this, for example. Look how the footnote ignores the rest of the sentence that doesn't suit her opinions and just sets a dot at half of it. It makes it very difficult to take this book seriously. And the thing that they're complaining about, let me see. So in a section about mental health and asexuality, um, I had quoted a study called Asexuality, a Mis Mixed Methods Approach. And um, I had quoted, I'd given a, a statement that was in my own words where I said that, the, that asexual people uh, are not more commonly mentally ill than other people of other sexual orientations and I put a little footnote there and then I had quoted this study and uh, the footnote was partial the in the part of the footnote that I used was there were not higher rates of psychopathology among asexuals and this person went ahead and looked up the entire article by these by, by the person that I quoted and highlighted the full quote, which was, there were not higher rates of psychopathology among asexuals. However, a, sub, a subset might fit the criteria for schizoid personality disorder. Um, and that's really disingenuous because it's still true that psychopathology is not the same thing as a personality disorder. So um, you'd have to, I mean, it, it might sound like splitting hairs, but um, I was also frequently trying to abbreviate the footnotes as much as I could so that I wasn't just making the footnotes fill up half the page in the sections where I was quoting a lot of stuff. And I mean, I hope that doesn't sound too much like a cop-out. That's not the entire reason I didn't quote the whole thing. But when you go into more detail understanding uh, also why uh, even diagnosis of schizoid personality disorder, for instance, um, would have possibly applied to more asexual people. Um, you're also going to be looking at older definitions of it because nowadays asexuality is actually named in the, in the DSM-5 as not being part of the sexual arousal disorders and whatnot. It's no longer understood to be automatically a sexual aversion disorder. There's been a lot more understanding of how asexuality as a sexual orientation fits into the whole mental health thing. And in the past, 
uh, you know, schizoid personality disorder, you can make some assertions about how it makes people not form typical relationships. And one of the metrics that we are often judged by is whether we have romantic relationships. We're automatically thought of as weirder if we tend not to date anyone or we are not in a relationship when we don't want to be. People are like, oh, so you're a serial killer? There's that same bias happens in mental health as well. So it wouldn't surprise me if actually more asexual people back in the days where um, the metrics were slightly different as to how you got diagnosed with this stuff in the first place, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if some people were misdiagnosed with that because people who were diagnosing them were going to say, oh, well, you don't have typical relationships. I'm not sure something else might be going on here. You might fall into this category. I'll go ahead and read to you the uh, description here, the short description for schizoid personality disorder. It's a personality disorder characterized by a lack of interest in social relationships, a tendency toward a solitary or sheltered lifestyle, secretiveness, emotional coldness, detachment, and apathy. So I've been told by some of my trolls and some of my detractors that, well, it's obvious you have that. That's really your problem. But I think it's kind of backwards. I think that when people see that you don't form typical relationships, they're like, well, obviously everybody sane knows that there's something wrong with that. So let's like give a name to that. Oh, you don't form these relationships. Well, that's definitive of this. I mean, it just kind of ends up being sort of circular sometimes, you know, and romantic relationships that are presumed to be sexual are so central to so many people's lives that, you know, a lot of even people who are in the mental health field will automatically assume that if you are not demonstrating interest in these, then there's bottom line something wrong with you. So, um, but even if I kind of step back and take away my suspicion that a lot of those diagnoses were based specifically on people being asexual. It wasn't the other way around. Um, you know, even if I were to take it at its word and be like, okay, maybe the asexual population has a higher um, instance of this particular personality disorder, even if I were to accept that that was true at face value, um, I would also say that we, like many other marginalized minorities in the sexual orientation and gender uh, marginalized people groups, <laughs> you know, we overall experience more anxiety, we may experience more insecurity, we may actually have more difficulty forming the relationships that we do want because of a lot of insecurity surrounding whether we're acceptable because of our weird sex problems. So, um, and we may also have um, less typical relationship styles. We may tend to want to be polyamorous more often, we may tend to be in BDSM circles. Um, there are all kinds of um, non-mainstream aspects of our lifestyles that may be more likely to occur in asexual people because of what we haven't swallowed, <laughs> what we have decided, okay, we're not going to have that be part of our lives. So we're, it kind of opens the door to looking at other opportunities to form relationships and how we're going to explore ourselves and be happy. It looks really weird to some people from outside and the first thing people do to weirdos is label them with a disorder. So um, anyway, uh, beyond that though we do share with the overall queer population, um, I believe there there is evidence for queer people having more mental disorders, not because those two things are comorbid, but because of the stress in our lives. 
um, just overall as a pattern, not as an individual situation. It's, it's not like everybody that you find of these populations is going to say that they have a history of mental illness, but um, it's, it's also true that you find that among poor people. So um, there's, there's a cause and effect relationship there where if your life sucks, then you tend to have a lot of anxiety about it. And then people look down from these ivory towers and they say, well, there's something wrong with that person. Um, it couldn't possibly be because living under stresses that the rest of us don't experience uh, really messes up your mind. But um, anyway, that aside, um, the person accuses me here of having cherry-picked that quote as if I was being disingenuous by suggesting that asexual people are not more likely to be mentally ill than anybody else in the same demographics of, as the rest of them. So um, I think that's a little bit suspicious because the person is, is there at least suggesting that I made the quote look like the opposite of what it said, um, as if I took it out of context completely. Um, I don't believe that the rest of that sentence hugely changes what it was saying. Um, it's another interesting aspect of what the people studied in that, in that uh, examination of asexual people, but it doesn't reveal something that I was trying to hide on purpose. Um, it is still true that asexual people were not found in that study to be more likely to experience and exhibit psychopathology. So it's, it's not an untrue statement. Um, and there were several other situations like that where either the person said that I was not quoting a source or they didn't like my source. They thought that I was misrepresenting what it was, what was being said. Um, and Obviously, I don't think I'm a perfect person, and there are definitely things that I, mostly minor things that I would change about the book if, if I were to re-release it today. But um, I think overall, just looking through the tag on Tumblr about my book or me as an author, uh, I found that quote but I also found mostly people who were in love with the book and were so happy to be seen and were relating to so many of the things that I said, including some of the same things that this person said needed a source. Um, and uh, for everybody who stands there with their arms crossed and says, where's your source, ma'am? Um, there are at least, you know, some I should say, to piss off people who are demanding the science, there are some people who are saying they see themselves in these poorly defined <laughs> populations that I'm saying are many or some, or a few, or a lot. So um, anyway, wrapping this up um, on the subject of academia, um, an asexual conference is happening in Vancouver pretty soon, and one of the evening events is, I don't know if you can see this, um, a book event, a book celebration with four asexual authors on a panel. So we're going to do this at a bookstore. I am Skyping in because Vancouver is very far away and also very chilly for me. I'm Floridian, so... I'm cold right now, and it's in the high 70s in my house, so the, uh, the book celebration is going to involve each of the asexual authors talking about their book for a little while and taking questions and I guess um, just talking about ace stuff. There's also going to be an art exhibit the night before, which sounds really cool and I wish I could be there and eat the snacks, but I'm just going to Skype in and the conference itself. Uh, which is entitled uh, Unthinking Sex, Imagining Asexuality, that it really sounds like a very cool conference. And um, I 
was told it was academically focused, so I was surprised to be invited as a, an author of a book that is not an academic book. But, uh, you know, I guess I quote some academics, so it's all good. Um, but even as an author that did not write an academic book, I, I think, you know, my book is still making some waves and making some, having some influence on academics because they can quote it as, you know, a community source. And there are lots of nice quotes that people can farm out of there, uh, you know, to back up what they're talking about for people describing their experiences. And when we describe our experiences, that's what we're doing. We're telling you what we went through. Um, it doesn't mean that we're making some kind of overall statement about how often this happens, but it at least happens sometimes, and it's worth mentioning in a book about our experiences. So um, I think that's about where I'm going to wrap this up, and I will talk to y'all next time I make a video, whenever that is. Thanks for watching.